Uh, as you see, uh, as you have heard, a wonderful introduction by Mark and Ron. It is overwhelming for me to see a full house. Welcome all of you. We must never forget that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And thank you for this unexpected award of the Margolis Prize. One morning, I received a telephone call from Marc Palanche, Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science at UBC. I had a bad conscience because I did not answer one of his requests, and so I apologized for being neglectful. He replied, I'm not calling you about this. I'm calling you because you were awarded the Margulies National Design for Living Prize. I was speechless and almost dropped the phone. It was Vikram Bhatt from McGill University who had won it previously for his work in ag urban agriculture and Bing Tom for his wonderful buildings. Both of the recipients I admired greatly and I was so happy to join their ranks. This prize makes me think of the timeline of the profession of landscape architecture from the 20th century onwards. Today and my part in it. As Ron mentioned, I wanted to be a landscape architect from my 11th year on and I had one wish to become a landscape architect. How did I learn about landscape architecture? My mother was a horticulturist and had many friends who were landscape architects, so I knew the word landscape architect. In the studio of an artist, I saw a mural of an imaginary city at the River Rhine, and I asked, what is this? It showed the roads, the houses, green spaces, and the artist so kindly explained to me and said, the green spaces are parks. When I came home, I told my mother that I wanted to do parks and become a landscape architect. Her reply was, then you have to drive a bulldozer. Because at that time, in landscape architects in Europe mostly offered design build services. To that I replied, oh goody. <laughs> Since then, my thoughts have been on that mural and to become a landscape architect and provide green spaces for those people living in cities. This lecture is a precious opportunity to think about my career within the context of the 20th and 21st century and the future of our work. It's called, Where Are We Going? Looking backwards is useful, but right now we are looking forward for a new meaning for the future generation of city builders and designers. And this is why we have arranged a symposium where new ideas with friends will flourish and will be discussed. And the audience will be participating. This evening I have se selected seven milestones both personal and professional, to share with you. I shall then present a selection of my landscape architecture projects as illustrations of my commitment to collaboration, modernism, sustainability, and ecological insight. The first a milestone is Charles Eliot, President Emeritus of Harvard, who wrote Landscape architecture is primarily a fine art, and as such, its most important function is to create and preserve beauty in the surroundings of human habitations and in the broader natural scenery of the country. But it's also concerned with promoting the comfort, convenience, and health of urban populations which have scant access to rural scenery and urgently need to have their hurrying working day lives refreshed and calmed by the beautiful and reposeful sights and sounds which nature, aided by the landscape architect, can provide. 
Today, in the 21st century, I would like to amend Charles Eliot's letter by saying that landscape architecture is not only a fine art, but also a science. Milestone number two. As you heard from Ron Kellett, I was admitted to the Holy Grail, Harvard, in 1943 as a student from Smith College. Walter Gropius, formerly of the Bauhaus in Germany, was then head of architecture at Harvard. My professors, Christopher Tannett and Lester Collins, opened my eyes to modernism and uh, the, in the background, however, the design principles of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts still lingered with curly Q flower borders. From these teachers, I learned not only collaboration, but basic design principles in the Bauhaus tradition as well as aesthetics, which are still expressed in my designs today. Hmm. Uh, this book uh, is from Susan Harrington, Making the Modern Landscape, which discusses my path of professionalism. After graduation, I had the good fortune to work in the architect's office of Louis Kahn and Oscar Stronoff in Philadelphia on public housing projects and with landscape architect Dan Kiley in his office in Charlotte, Vermont. One day after a walk in the woods, Dan said, Cornelia, walk lightly in the woods. I replied, but Dan, I always wear sneakers. He looked at me quizzically and commented no further. Later on, it dawned on me that he meant study the woodland and preserve it. Thus I learned about the ecology of New England and could later transfer this knowledge to the Pacific Northwest. Milestone three is Rachel Carson. the book uh, Silent Spring, and it made us aware of that, uh, that we should not use pesticides. It was published in 1963 and allowed me to understand how all living creatures and land are interconnected. Milestone four. Well, it's not coming. Yeah, milestone four. Earth Day is an annual was Earth Day. It is celebrated on April 22nd. It was founded by Gaylord Nelson and first celebrated on March 21, 1970, the first day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Today, we celebrate Earth Week, an entire week of activities, activities focused on environmental issues. Here is the DDT, and here is Let Me Grow Up on, Earth Day, on the first Earth Day. Milestone number five is the Brundtland Report. The Grow Brundtland, uh, issued in 1987 a report, Our Common Future. It was published and it recognized that environmental problems were global in nature and urged the UN General Assembly to establish policies for sustainable urban development. Pressing this book in my hands, my late husband Peter Overlander said, this will change your landscape, and so it did, as shown in the projects over the last 30 years. And milestone number six is climate change. It is upon us, as we all know. Here is sustainable development meets the needs of the present generation 
without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And that was what Gro Brundtland wrote. So now we are dealing with climate change. We all know about it. The 21st conference of the parties met in Paris recently, and it may have been our last chance for a meaningful agreement to shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy before ongoing damage to the world's climate becomes irreversible and devastating. And that is the time we are working in today. On January 1st, 2016, the United Nations issued a new land, a new list of 17 sustainable development goals concerning the design professions. And these goals are good health and well-being for all, quality of education, industry, innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, life, addressing life below water, life on land, and having partnership goals. Today, more than ever, the design professions can play an important role in ameliorating conflict between the built and natural environments. Landscape architecture should be a leading edge profession in collaboration with other professionals. You can no longer solve these problems yourself. You have to have teamwork. The scale of our environmental challenges demands a new group of multidisciplinary trained professionals. We are concerned with the bigger picture of our built and natural environment. E.O. Wilson, the great scientist, wrote biophilia hypothesis, and he suggests a biologically based instinctive bond between humans and their environment. In short, longing for nature is built into our gene. And he goes further to urge us that we must keep every scrap of nature in and around our cities. Nature holds the key to our aesthetic, intellectual, cognitive, and even spiritual satisfaction. Now we get to milestone number seven. The pressure of population on our city has resulted in increased densification with more high rises and less accessibility to nature. It is essential that we replace the footprint of the many high rises that are now going up in Vancouver and other cities with green roofs and solar collectors to elevate, to alleviate energy consumption and to reduce stormwater runoff. Recently, this became a law in the city of Paris. As we all recognize, Metro Vancouver is no exception to the pressure of growth and the need for thoughtful and creative densification. Challenges and opportunities lie ahead for everyone. In order to accomplish our goals, we must practice what I call the three R's on ever, every project. Research, shouldering responsibility, and above all, risk-taking to meet the challenges faced by our finite planet. We also need what I call VIM, namely vision, imagination, and motivation by all those involved in building resilient and sustainable cities and communities. Today, we need to design landscape that can withstand drought, rising water levels, floods, and storms, in addition to being accessible to the citizens. This means landscape architects must design with newly acquired knowledge to develop bold concepts of bringing nature into the city. Right now, today, we are all groping for new solutions in landscape architecture and city living. We need to look at new models of sustainability here and abroad. We need to encourage 
engage our citizens once again to help us define what our city could be. And so here I would like to show some of the slides. This is a sketch by Arthur Erickson who wrote in 1992, what thwarts our wish to make the best of cities and make something less than it properly should be? Why, as planners, architects, developers, buildings, citizens, do we fall short of the challenges set for us by the majesty of the place? And he continues, the citizens of Vancouver must demonstrate their concern. He challenges us with a new growth and every move, every decision we make at this moment is determining the city that we leave for future generations. He wrote that a long time ago and we are at a point where we have to decide how we are going to grow. So now I will show a few of my projects and this happens to be a garden of 1953 when I came here to practice landscape architecture. The architect Fred Lasser, after whom the Lasser building is named in, at UBC, was the architect who called me to collaborate to make this garden. And this house is a typical house of the regional style of the 50s. And you wonder why there's a huge gravel courtyard. I knew already then that I couldn't plant this area because there was bedrock underneath. And so I made a wonderful butterfly shape of a garden with gravel. And the Two doctors that owned this house could look from their studies onto the garden and enjoy the plants. This has been restored exactly as it was, and I hope it can be preserved. We are at a point now where we're erasing our past and we are forgetting about what we were trying to do many years ago. I worked with Arthur on the Robson Square and the growing city. And here's Robson Square, which is an oasis in the city. We have green areas, we have open areas, we have waterfall, and somehow rather this project needs a little renewal. Uh, here is the quiet area. You can walk through it and sit on benches and enjoy yourself. This is the other side. And uh, people come and like to sit in the sunshine. And on the street, instead of having street trees every 10 meters on center, we managed to talk the city into having the trees five meters on center, which gives an allay, and it also gives the feeling that you are protected from the rain or sun. Uh, I also work way up north in the country of the Northwest Territories. This is the Legislative Assembly building, and the architects were Matsusaki Wright and Jim Wright and Gino Pin. And it was a huge team that we did this. Yellowknife is just below the Arctic Circle. And this was a peat bog that needed attention when the road was built. And uh, it was pilfered by the citizens of Yellowknife. And so it looked very destitute. However, I saw that you could transplant mats of growing things and put them down. And today, this peat bog is completely restored to its glory. I also uh, believe that you can't plant anything up there. 
And so I went up there with a seed collector in order to put new the plants that were there at one time uh, into the ground. We collected the seeds. We went to Vancouver to a propagation facility. And two years later, we flew back with the plant and planted them in the crevasses amongst the rocks, just as they were wanting to grow. This is called invisible mending, and I practice that in several projects way up north. Here is the building, uh, the view from the lake, the trees are all preserved, and the wilderness is growing. And in the winter, it's dark and cold, but very beautiful. Uh, another project here in the city uh, with a big team, Busby, Birkins and Will architects and uh, Sharp and Diamond landscape architects, we managed to uh, have a green roof. And the green roof uh, is a shape of an orchid that was described by uh, Archibald Menzies as he came up the coast. And this is our flowing green roof with solar collectors. And it's inaccessible, unfortunately. I would like to have a zip line over it, but there's no money for it. And so uh, this roof is planted uh, from uh, the book of Menzies' legacy written by Clive Justice, and it has all the features of a roof that is with bulbs, and the grass that grows on it has to be cut only one, once a year. So it's a different idea about a green roof. And you come to this wonderful visitor center, as many of you know, on a bridge, and you enter the the visitor center, and you can take a peek sometimes at the roof and you see the various uh, leaves of the orchid leaf. In, in July, the, it's pink. Right now in the spring, it will be blue, the roof, with blue kamas. In the summer, it's with nodding onions, all interesting. However, it has another feature, it's a rainwater garden. And this rainwater garden fills up when it rains and the water is shed from the roof into it. And so uh, we have uh, a living building that is interesting all year and it's part of the botanical garden. However, I like to show you what other people have been thinking about the city. Here's Habitat 67 at the uh, a great Montreal World's Fair. This is Moshe's uh, thesis, graduating thesis, Moshe Safdie's graduating thesis from McGill. And it has these wonderful layers and a screen and this is what I think we should have more of in our cities. Here are new habitats in China and also Singapore. Green, people are always with nature, their paths, and you don't feel cooped up. Here are other solutions in Singapore. Singapore is far ahead in, in dealing with a density. And now we have the Hundertwasser House in Vienna, which is imaginative, full of fun. It has a cafe, it has greenery, it's overgrown, and nobody is left out. Here is a cafe, there is a terrace with a big tree, and the artist Hundertwasser created this. And now we go on to the surprise panel and more challenges. And uh, we will hear now 
uh, we will hear now from our panelists. But I would like to tell you that in June of this year, 50 years later, uh, a new, a new uh, dictum will be made for how landscape architects should work and how we should deal with climate change and densification of cities. We have reached a new period in this world, the Holocene period, which is the last ice age, is finished. And we are entering a new phase called Anthropocene, which translates roughly as the human age for which we have to find design solutions. And so I would like to introduce the panel, the symposium. <laughs> 